Week 35, establishing his church in double time. And so that you understand that the, the challenge that Jesus Christ has in these chapters that we're reading is he's trying to do in three weeks what took him three years in the old country. And so everything is is pushed forward. And I think especially in these two chapters tonight, we're going to see the results of that. And it's it's including, la I should say, the five chapters we've read over the last two weeks. It's pretty extraordinary, some of the experiences. So here's what you've read. I'm not going to spend too much time here. You see it every week, but I'm going to pause long enough if someone wants to get a snapshot of that to certainly get that snapshot if you wish to. But that's what you've accomplished over the last 34 weeks, which wow. is, which is a, a bit over, um, feels a whole lot like eight, eight months. All right. So, so looking at, um, what you've accomplished so far, again, I won't spend too much time here because we do it every week, 210 chapters, 5,139 verses, almost 140,000 words and 60 hours of discussion. I did a few little um, analogies so you understood. 139,000 words is, is about two normal length books is what wow. we discussed. And the 60 hours is two and a half days of pure scripture talk. That's pretty great. I remember mm -hmm. when we used to get together at the house uh, down in Florida and we'd talk for hours, just scripture talk for never two and a half days in total. So that I'm really, mm -hmm. really tickled over how much you guys have worked and, and how much you've discussed the word. And I pray the Lord blesses you for those efforts. Um, I, I just know he's going to, too. So here's what we got. We're cramming three years into three weeks is what I said. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's a fun thing to think about. So 3 Nephi 18 through 19, 18 and 19 is two chapters, 75 verses, and 2,500 plus words. That's what you did this week. It's going to give us enough time and enough words and enough verses that we have some real, real deep discussion points. Whether we go that way for our discussion, we'll see. So in a, in a short, and this, this is really an abbreviated um, overview, but I wanted to try to capture a flavor. So these... These chapters, remember, they directly follow what we read last week. And what we read last week is 2,500 Josephite witnesses. I want to continue to reinforce who he's speaking to. He's speaking to one twelfth, or at least representation of one twelfth of Israel. He's certainly not talking to one twelfth of Israel, but a representation of one twelfth. And, and specifically, these were the descendants of Joseph, the favored son. Um, and so, again, remember, it was 2,500, and it said they were men, women, and children who were there listening to Jesus Christ. Again, setting the tone last week, after he descended from the sky and proved himself to be uh, the son of God without any question, undoubtedly the, undoubtedly the son of God, after a few after a few words he spoke and really quickly it became very very personal and that's where i want to go with this uh, some of the effects of this interaction be between jesus christ and this specific audience i believe in this specific place remember he voiced an ache for israel he groaned within himself is what it said he expressed a, a great joy for the children who were surrounded, surrounding him. And, and think of that change from ache to joy, moments apart. Knowing mm. the time was short in the Americas, he quickly transitioned to teaching the basic fundamentals of his gospel, of his church. So, uh, in, again, in short form, he taught the house of Joseph firsthand about baptism, communion, and the reception of the Holy Ghost. They were baptized, they took communion, and they received, and there's a beautiful verse, probably one of my favorites in the, in the, in the Word of God. They received that which they desired most, and that was the Holy Ghost. To think that a people were, were had the foresight to understand the value of this gift 
that which they desired most was the Holy Ghost. I hope later we can discuss, address maybe the verse and discuss it in detail in our open discussion if one of you choose that verse or want to talk about it. There was something about this people, though. There was something about this specific tribe, this specific facet of the house of Israel, or so I believe. I want to be careful about how I say this, but I do believe there was something about them that created this stir that seems so different than even his interactions in Jerusalem. Those that he grew up with, those that he was born into, this community he was born into, there was something different about where he landed here in the Americas. Again, I say this every week, I'll say it again. I can't wait to see the book of Naphtali and the book of Dan and the book of Asher and see what they wrote and see if there's similarities or not. But for now, we only have two to, to see and compare. And I think there's something very different. And I'm going to describe a little bit what that difference is in the next slide. Was it because they were the true descendants of the favored son, Joseph? Maybe. I don't know. Was it because of their role in Israel's future? Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to stir your spirits up. That's all. One more example of this extraordinary account with these extraordinary people, with this extraordinary man, the son of God. Listen to this now. If you know John, the 17th chapter, you know that's the one that we get this insight into Jesus praying to his father. If you don't know that chapter, there's a great homework assignment mm -hmm. away from our own assignment, John 17. But we are privy in this book or this chapter, 3 Nephi 19, not just to one, but two different John 17 moments. Two different prayers are recorded. And it even says that the third prayer, that again, he, he came to his people and walked away and prayed. Came to his people, walked away and prayed. Came to his people, walked away and prayed a third time. But it says they were unable to even write down what he said. So we don't capture the, 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 the monologue from son to father. And it says why. It says this. Tongue cannot speak the words which he prayed. Neither can be written by man the words which he prayed. They couldn't even write the words. First, they couldn't repeat them, but they couldn't even write them. Maybe, uh, I think we read a verse last week that said something about they couldn't even conceive. Maybe that was it. It was too, it was too far beyond man's thinking. I don't know, but that, I'm just reading you the verse of how it says it. Interesting discussion might involve, and I'm trying to lead you gently, might involve the son's emotions, the multiple emotions he experienced in this short time period. For me, unlike anything, or at least specifically anything that we read in the four Gospels, yes, we read of an account here or an account there. Yeah, when he went into in, and faced Lazarus or, or faced the tomb for Lazarus, it says that he wept. We get that. We, we get that. But over and over and over, it seems in this short clip of time, he experienced all kinds of emotions. Why? Unlike that three-year span in Jerusalem, why? Was it the audience? As I said earlier, uh, the house of, of, of Joseph. But remember, he was speaking to the house of Israel back in, in Jerusalem. This is still the house of Israel. Judah back there, Joseph here. Was it the audience? Was it his perception of who Joseph was? Was it his perception of who Joseph was to be? Was it his perception of what Joseph needed to understand now to pass on so that Joseph would step up when necessary? And for us, it's even still in the future where they take on that role because we're not there yet. So let's look at some of his emotions. Next slide is going to capture some of those emotions. Short one slide, but it's not much more. It's, it's, I'm capturing in one slide what was really only for maybe pushed into the, the fifth chapter as well. So this is not a big target. It's a very, very small target with just a couple days, so it seems, that we're capturing. So let's look at some of those emotions. 
he made this statement to them before he anointed and prayed for them, or before he, yeah, before he prayed and healed them. Behold, my bowels are filled with compassion for you. Imagine hearing that before you are about to be prayed for and healed. It said he groaned within himself. He also said, my joy is full. Think of just those three emotions right there. And they're almost side by side. These are really captured in 10 to 15 verses, I think in that 16th chapter. He wept just after that. He wept again. After that, no tongue can speak, neither can there be written by any man, neither can the hearts of men conceive such great and marvelous things as we both saw and heard Jesus speak. And no one can conceive of the joy which filled our souls at the time we heard him pray for us to, unto the Father. This was before these two prayers that we are, we're about to see. Also this, while the angels were ministering, this is what we read tonight, unto the disciples, behold, Jesus came and stood in the midst and ministered to them. And I want to remind you. That's how he enters back into the, the conversation. How he exited that conversation was it said he ascended back into the heavens. I don't read where he descended. I just read where he came and stood in the midst of them while they were praying. Fabulous. While the angels were ministering, he came in and ministered. Just incredible. I want you to think about all that they were witnessing, all that he was experiencing goes on to say this, he's speaking of the 12 that he had chosen. He touched with his hand the disciples whom he had chosen, one by one, even until he touched them all, and listen to this, and spake unto them as he touched them. Oh, that we had those words. I would love to have had a capture of what he said to each one of those. This also, his countenance did smile upon them. The light of his countenance did shine upon them. My prayer is that each one of us at some point experience such magnificence that his countenance might smile upon you and that his light might shine upon you. Imagine that. And imagine what he must have been experiencing to present such an experience it goes on to say he did smile upon them again who are these people that that are stirring him to such degrees i don't read this anywhere else to such degree to such magnitude there must have been something happening in the americas this also is are his words so great faith have i never seen among all the Jews. Is this some insight to why he was so stirred? And then lastly, we read this. There are none of them that I have seen so great things as you, excuse me, there are none of them that have seen so great things as you have seen. I have to believe it's because of that great faith that he had never seen among the Jews. And later he went on to say, neither have they heard so great things as you have heard. And we know that was also described as they couldn't even write it. At least some of what they heard couldn't even write it. This is what you read in these two chapters. This is stirring stuff. What I'd love for you to, to see if you want to discuss is whether or not the whys and the hows and the whats of all of this. So we'll see where your conversation goes. I don't mean to press so hard, but I just found a lot within these two chapters and a lot that stirred me up to, to think about all these things. So maybe it's time that we talk Jesus, we talk Joseph, and we talk Israel. That's